Okay, we'll start with uh, Süddeutsche, yeah, third row, thanks. Daniel Brössler, Süddeutsche Zeitung. Secretary General, are you worried if you look at the conflict between two NATO members, Turkey and the Netherlands right now, uh, the attacks coming from Turkey, calling, uh, calling uh, the Netherlands fascist, uh, similar attacks towards Germany. Is that, uh, you would say, the way uh, allies uh, should treat each other or is that weakne weakening the alliance? And there have been, the second question if I may, there have been uh, discussions in Germany if as a reaction to that uh, Bundeswehr soldiers should be called back from Turkey. Is that something uh, that is worrying you? Thank you. Robust debate is at the heart of our democracy, but so is also mutual respect. And therefore, I will encourage all allies to show mutual respect, uh, to uh, uh, be calm and uh, uh, have a measured approach uh, to contribute to de-escalate the tensions and diffuse uh, uh, tensions and de-escalate the situation. Uh, and uh, I think it's important that we now focus on everything that unites us, uh, the common challenges, uh, the threats, uh, and how NATO is adapting, and, uh, and uh, that we not uh, focus uh, on uh, issues that occasionally uh, divides uh, us. Um, I think it is important that we have dialogue, uh, and I think it is, it is important also to understand that uh, um, we supported each other. Uh, so, for instance, NATO uh, presence in Turkey is good for Turkey, but it's also good for uh, Europe and the rest of the alliance. Uh, we work with them to address the threats and the challenges, uh, uh, the violence, the turmoil we see in Syria and, uh, and, uh, and Iraq. That is, of course, important for Turkey, that NATO is present there with our capabilities, our forces, our AWACS planes, our... Uh, we are augmenting the air defenses of Turkey, but it's also an important part of what NATO does when it comes to helping and supporting the uh, global coalition fighting ISIL. So uh, this is in our interest that we work together uh, to uh, address uh, common challenges and, and, and threats, and that's exactly what we should do uh, more of together with Turkey in fighting ISIL. Okay, uh, Itatas, back then. Mr. Secretary General, Denis Dubrovin, uh, TASS News Agency. Uh, according to your uh, report, uh, what's the general evaluation of the situation in the world? Is the uh, security situation improving or degenerating? And uh, which, uh, in, in, in which areas uh, you would say uh, the situation is the most grave? Thank you. So what we have seen over the last uh, couple of years is uh, uh, increased tensions and, uh, and a new security environment surrounding uh, uh, NATO. Uh, we have seen more turmoil, more violence to the south uh, with the Daesh ISIL uh, taking control over big parts of Syria and Iraq. They are now on the defensive, they are losing ground, but still they are absolutely present and uh, uh, we need to continue to support uh, the global, global coalition uh, uh, fighting uh, ISIL. At the same time, we have seen a more assertive Russia uh, uh, annexing uh, Crimea, uh, illegally annexing Crimea, and destabilizing eastern Ukraine. Uh, and all of this is uh, what NATO is responding to. Uh, but for me, it's very hard to compare different threats and challenges. ISIL is a terrorist organization, uh, a brutal organization responsible for uh, 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 terrorist attacks and the brutality we have hardly seen before. Uh, 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 Russia is a neighbor, Russia is there to stay, and we are striving for a more constructive relationship with, with Russia, and therefore also welcome the fact that we have been able to reactivate the political dialogue with Russia uh, in 2016 uh, with three meetings of the NATO-Russia uh, Council. So my message is that NATO is strong because we are able to adapt. NATO is strong because when the world is changing, NATO is changing. Union. Thank you, uh, Secretary General. Recently, uh, President of European Commission, Mr. Uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, put at the table five different scenarios for European Union. And for now, it looks like 
the European Union of different speed countries are most preferably within the 20 uh, of EU. Uh, from other hand, they're also talking about necessity to increase spending on the defense in the EU. How do you think all these plans can influence NATO uh, also, and in particularly in the part when NATO has to increase money on its own defense, don't you think that when uh, ally, European ally will increase spending in the EU, they will not spend in NATO? And so the ultimatum of Mr. Trump at the end of this year will be a reality. Thank you. I think it's very important to understand that there is no contradiction between stronger uh, NATO and stronger uh, European defense. Actually, it goes together because uh, 22 uh, of uh, the members of the European Union are at the same time members of uh, the NATO uh, alliance. And more than 90% of the people living in the European Union, they live in NATO country. So uh, stronger European defense means at the same time stronger Europe uh, NATO. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, NATO has called for more defense spending in Europe uh, in many years. We have called for the development of uh, new capabilities, more training, more exercises, but also to address some of the obvious challenges uh, we have in Europe with a very fragmented defense industry, which makes uh, the, the development of capabilities more costly in Europe than, uh, for instance, in the United States. So I welcome efforts to strengthen uh, um, defense cooperation uh, within the European Union. Uh, because I believe that will strengthen the defenses of Europe and also uh, uh, strengthen uh, uh, NATO. Um, the only thing which is important is that uh, what the European Union does uh, do not duplicate what NATO uh, uh, does and, uh, and that, uh, and that uh, it is complementary. And therefore, I welcome the very clear message from uh, many European leaders that this is not about a European army. This is not about creating new command structures which are parallel or overlapping NATO command structures. And this is not about the European Union being responsible for collective defense in Europe. Uh, because collective defense in Europe is NATO's main responsibility. And especially after Brexit, uh, I think it's obvious that uh, we need uh, NATO and the European Union working together, not competing because 80% of NATO's defense expenditure will be non-EU. And the three of the four battalions or battle groups we have in the East will be non led by non-EU countries, the European, uh, sorry, UK, uh, Canada, and United States. So as long as this is not about a competition, but that we work in complementarity, and that's the declared goal from the European Union, that's something I, I welcome. Then, uh, then I think we should only welcome uh, efforts to strengthen uh, European defense. And if, uh, if, for instance, Germany increased defense spending, that will be good for Europe, the European Union, and NATO. Okay, uh, Wall Street Journal. Julian, uh, Julian Barnes, Wall Street Journal. Um, President Trump has said, uh, in addition to more defense spending, he wants a more of a focus on uh, counterterrorism from NATO. Uh, you and other uh, allied officials have talked about uh, NATO's contribution being in uh, uh, building partnership capacity. This report outlines a lot of different areas where you're doing training missions. What is the way forward? Is it doing more training missions, or is it doing training missions more quickly, or is it doing them in a different way to make them more effective? What is your thinking of how you're going to address this uh, demand that NATO adapt and evolve? It may be all, all three of them. Uh, and we have an open mind uh, to how NATO can step up its efforts to fight terrorism. I think the important thing to know uh, or to understand is that we have to do it in different ways, in different regions and in different uh, parts of the world. And we need tailored, uh, made approaches to the different countries we are working with. We have one approach in Afghanistan, and we must not forget that Afghanistan is about fighting terrorism. The reason why we went into Afghanistan uh, was a direct response to a terrorist attack on the United States. And the main reason why we still are in Afghanistan 
is to prevent Afghanistan from becoming a safe haven for international terrorists. We have 13,000 13, troops there. And, and if there's any lesson learned from Afghanistan, it's that we should have started early to train local forces to build local capacity. So that's what we do in Afghanistan now. Uh, the Afghans are responsible for security in their own country themselves. We train, help, and assist them. We can not copy that, but we can uh, get some inspiration from that when we, for instance, work in Iraq. Uh, and uh, again, I think it's extremely important that we train local forces. Uh, uh, when Mosul is liberated, we need some local forces uh, to keep the territory, to, to stabilize uh, the, the region. And as long as we don't plan to deploy uh, our own forces, and, and that's not on the agenda at all, then we need uh, local uh, forces. We also have this concept of deployable uh, mobile teams. So we have deployed mobile training teams from NATO to different countries in the region, uh, and we will continue to do uh, so. We, are, we have established a hub in the south, which can coordinate more activities. Uh, and of course, we can also do more when it comes to just helping to build defense institutions. Because it's, it's not sufficient to train troops if you don't have defense structures, institutions, that can make sure that those troops are led, coordinated in a good way. That's exactly what we are, for instance, now starting to address in, in Libya. So we have a wide range of opportunity, possibilities. NATO is already doing a lot, and we describe all the different activities in the, uh, in the annual report. But I, I, I can foresee that we can actually scale up some of the activities we have. And we can also, of course, uh, uh, do different kinds of acti activities in addition. Egyptian TV, second row. I'm here. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm Mac Youssef from the Egyptian television. Uh, Secretary General, you NATO did uh, recognize the Belgium embassy to be the link between NATO and uh, Egypt. And Egypt uh, uh, will be present with uh, a high level of diplomat in NATO uh, soon. Uh, how this is will change the cooperation between NATO and Egypt, and is there is any talk between NATO and Egypt to work together in Libya? Thank you very much. I welcome very much that Egypt uh, is establishing a mission to NATO and will appoint an ambassador uh, to NATO. That will strengthen the cooperation, uh, the partnership between NATO and uh, Egypt. I recently met with the Egyptian uh, foreign minister. We had a good and constructive meeting. Uh, NATO uh, is working with Egypt in different ways. Uh, uh, we have, for instance, deployed our uh, mobile training team to Egypt. Uh, we are working uh, with uh, Egypt to increase interoperability. And, and, uh, and, of course, when I met with the foreign minister, we also uh, discussed the situation in, in Libya. And, of course, Egypt being so close, a uh, key uh, nation, uh, we, uh, I express from the NATO side that we are ready to help uh, build uh, structures, uh, defense institutions in Libya, uh, but we also strongly support the UN-led efforts to try to find a negotiated political solution. So the political dialogue is an important part of the partnership, and the political dialogue will be strengthened by the new Egyptian uh, uh, diplomatic mission to NATO. Financial Times. Uh, hi, Arthur Beasley here. Um, in your assessment, Secretary General, are efforts by Germany to increase defence spending, which are underway, are those efforts sufficient at this time? Thank you. The important thing is that Germany has uh, turned the corner. Because of the years of decline in defence spending, uh, they have now stopped uh, the cuts in defence spending and actually started to increase. And if you, afterwards you will have the annual report, and I think it's table three, then you will see the uh, real change uh, in defense spending uh, for all, all individual allies. And Germany has an increase in 2016. I, of course, expect Germany, as all other allies, to continue uh, to keep up uh, the momentum and to continue to invest more in defense. And of course, uh, I expect that from all allies, but Germany being the biggest economy in Europe, it really matters what Germany does. And therefore, I welcome the very clear messages from Chancellor Mer Merkel and from other German leaders that they will now start to invest more in our defense. This is not just about you know, a call from uh, the United States and from President Trump. This is also about that it is a decision made by 28 allies together it is in Europe's own interest to invest more in defense. 
and, uh, and I welcome the fact that Germany has started. Uh, Germany, as many other allies, have a long way to go, but at least after years of decline, uh, we have now seen that the, uh, they are moving in the uh, right direction. And this has been my main issue uh, the, when I met different political leaders in different uh, NATO capitals since I became Secretary General in 2014. Uh, and of course, uh, I spoke with Chancellor Merkel uh, recently, and that was one of the issues we discussed, how we, can we make sure that we continue uh, to uh, uh, invest more in uh, defense. ARD, third round. Kai Kustner, ARD, German Radio. And once more back to Turkey. The Human Rights Watchdog Council of Europe has uh, sharply criticized Turkey for its plans to establish a presidential rule in the country. Since NATO is also based on democratic values, does that pose a, a problem for the alliance? And can Turkey actually stay a member of NATO in case the presidential rule is established? Well, that's exactly what they're now discussing in Turkey. And there is a campaign going on. Uh, some are in favor and some are against. Uh, uh, but that is going to be decided uh, by a referendum in Turkey. And uh, of course, I, uh, there's no way I respect the outcome of that referendum. And it's up to each and every ally to, to decide through democratic processes what kind of uh, presidential or parliamentary rule uh, they would like to have as, la as long as this is uh, done in a democratic way. Latvian Radio. In Strasdini Radio, Latvia. Secretary General, uh, do you have more information about uh, military uh, training, uh, Zapat 2017, uh, which uh, uh, Russia will start in autumn and very close to the Baltic uh, borders? Are you uh, in touch with Russian authorities? And it's supposed to start uh, uh, quite uh, soon after NATO uh, battle groups will be deployed in, in the Baltics. Thank you. First of all, I think it's important to remember that every nation has the right to exercise its own troops and forces. That is also the case for Russia. NATO uh, conduct exercises, Russia conduct exercises, and that's part of uh, uh, our obligations when we have a, uh, armed, force, our armed forces. Uh, the important thing is that exercises are conducted in a way uh, which do not increase tensions, which do not lead to misunderstanding, and which is uh, fully in compliance with our international obligations. For instance, uh, in compliance with the Vienna document, where there are requirements uh, related to how exercises are notified and uh, uh, international observation of exercises. And I would welcome uh, that uh, any invitation from Russia to observe uh, SAPA 2017, and, that, uh, and I also expect uh, Russia to fully uh, uh, come uh, to uh, ad adhere to uh, their international uh, um, commitments under the Vienna uh, uh, document because that's the best way to keep tensions down and to avoid any misunderstanding. I will also add that one of the issues we have discussed we, uh, in the NATO Russia Council is uh, uh, we discussed at the last meeting before Christmas, uh, no, in January, no, when was the last meeting? Last year, uh, last year in December. Uh, 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 we discussed how we can uh, strengthen the NATO-Russia Council as a forum for uh, briefings, uh, reciprocal briefings on exercises. Uh, and then, of course, I hope that Russia will be willing to brief on uh, support. Okay. NPR, Deutsche Welle in the middle. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General Terry Schultz. Um, back to Turkey. Um, have you had any conversations with um, either the Dutch government or the Turkish government um, about the dispute, about your call for, um, besides publicly here, about your call for calm and de-escalation. And given the fact that the Dutch flag was taken down on the consulate in Istanbul um, over the weekend uh, and a Turkish flag raised, have you taken any steps or, uh, or sought any reassurances that um, NATO bases, for example, that the unrest could rise to a level where they, they could actually threaten the security of uh, NATO installations there. Thanks. So over the weekend, have, I have been in contact with uh, the Turkish and the Dutch uh, government. Uh, I think I should not go into the details of those uh, conversations. Uh, but of course, my message has been the same. That uh, uh, debate, discussion, Robust debate is part of our democracy, but at the same time, mutual respect is important. 
and that calm and de-escalation is important now to diffuse uh, the uh, tensions. Uh, and, uh, and that has been my message, uh, because I really believe that uh, uh, we should be focus on uh, the threats and the challenges we see from outside the alliance and everything that unites us instead of focusing on issues that uh, divides us. Okay. I will not go into any specifics, but I will just, uh, because this is a bilateral issue between uh, uh, NATO allies, uh, uh, but what I can say is that I call, urge all allies uh, to uh, act in a measured uh, uh, and calm way to reduce tensions. Europa Press. Um, thank you, Anna Pisonero from the Spanish News Agency, Europa Press. I'm um, sorry, I have to ask on Spain because it's still one of the biggest uh, countries and um, we've gone down now to the second lowest, uh, well, the second lowest country dedicating most GDP. Uh, estimations from uh, July from NATO were actually, we would be the third, but we're actually, we seem to be getting worse. So are you worried, uh, you know, that, that that Spain can compromise this this uh, this uh, efforts on, on on sharing better the burden uh, because of the uh, U.S.'s uh, clear call on this. Thank you. Spain contributes uh, to NATO in many different uh, ways. I have uh, uh, seen Spanish soldiers uh, doing the joint juncture exercise. Uh, we had uh, last year, I think it was. Uh, then uh, Spain is, for instance, one of the countries that are contributing to the assurance measures in Turkey. They, are, they, are, they have deployed a Patriot battery to Turkey, and I thank Spain for that. Uh, Turkey is one of the nations which are responsible for leading uh, one of the uh, spearhead uh, uh, brigades we have established. And Spain is contributing in many different ways to our collective uh, security and to projecting stability to, an, to our uh, uh, neighborhood. Uh, having said that, uh, of course, Spain, as many other allies, invest too little in uh, defense. And that's exactly why we decided in 2014 to stop the cuts, gradually increase, and to move towards uh, spending 2% of GDP on defense. And, uh, and I expect that Spain uh, will uh, deliver on that. Uh, I, I know that it's difficult. Uh, I have been in, in national governments myself, uh, and I know it's always hard to find money for defense because all politicians will prefer to spend on education, on health, on infrastructure. Uh, and of course, uh, almost all allies decreased defense spending after the end of the Cold War when tensions went down. But my message is that, uh, uh, if we are, uh, or when we are reducing defense spending in times uh, with reduced uh, tensions, we have to be able to increase defense spending when tensions are going up, and now tensions have gone up, and therefore we have to invest more in defense. Kabul Times, second row. Uh, thank you, Secretary. You talked about Afghanistan and also mentioned it since 15 years NATO is in Afghanistan. That's true, but uh, as a Afghan and a lot of Afghans believe NATO is not succeed in Afghanistan and always the same policy like train, advice and assist, assistance. So is there any possibility to change this policy or be a little bit more strong to again sending many mm, soldiers in Afghanistan or uh, uh, more paying attention for the equipment for the Afghan soldiers. And also, as you know, there is a really very different and difficult situation in Afghanistan and also tension between Afghanistan and Pakistan since months and weeks and months. What's, uh, as Afghanistan is a partner with the NATO, so what's your advice for this country and how do you think for the future of Afghanistan? Thank you. I totally agree that uh, there are many challenges in Afghanistan and uh, there is uh, still violence and the Taliban is still a real threat and we have many different terrorist groups that operate uh, in Afghanistan. So uh, 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 I'm aware of uh, the challenges and the difficulties in Afghanistan. Having said that, I also would like to underline that we have achieved a lot together. Uh, when NATO troops arrived uh, almost 15 years ago, we hardly had a functioning uh, state, uh, and there was hardly any, what should I say, real uh, national uh, security force in Afghanistan. Uh, then we have helped to build a 
Afghan National Security Force, uh, consisting of 350,000 troops, uh, uh, military and police. And they are now able to, to, to have the responsibility for the security in their own country themselves. And that, but but that's, that's, that's at least something compared to the situation before, where Afghanistan was totally dependent on troops from other countries uh, uh, being responsible for security in Afghanistan. So again, I'm not saying that it's easy. I'm, I'm aware that there are high casualty numbers and, uh, and, uh, and there are terrorist attacks and there are many challenges. But compared to a time where NATO had more than 100,000 troops uh, conducting big combat operations in Afghanistan. Now NATO has 13,000 troops and the Afghans are responsible for security in their own country. And in the long run, I'm absolutely confident that the only way that we can stabilize Afghanistan is that the Afghans take responsibility for their own future themselves. In the long run, they cannot be dependent on NATO sending uh, tens of thousands of combat troops into combat operations fighting in Afghanistan. So yes, I understand this is difficult, but I think the transformation from NATO doing big combat operations to handing over responsibility for security in Afghanistan to the Afghans themselves has been a significant achievement that we have made together with the Afghan troops. We will continue to train them, and I'm also encouraged by how Afghanistan is developing new capabilities, like for instance air forces, and how they are including also women uh, in their armed forces. I met uh, Afghan pilots being trained by NATO uh, trainers. That's great to see. And then I want to also add that we will be, uh, we, are, we are there to train, help, assist, but we are also there with money. We are continuing to fund uh, the Afghan uh, National Army. We have committed uh, for uh, three more, four more years until 2020, uh, and we have a political dialogue. And part of that is also, of course, to support all efforts to try to find a negotiated political solution. And part of that is, of course, also to involve neighbors like uh, Pakistan. And good neighborly uh, relations uh, are of great importance to find a lasting, peaceful solution to the conflict in Afghanistan. Uh, Bersoir, third row. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Philippe Renier, uh, newspaper Le Soir. Um, you mentioned uh, the fact that uh, Montenegro's accession to NATO will bring more uh, stability in the region. But don't you fear that uh, at the same time um, Russia will try to, to, to disrupt this process? Thank you. So we have seen reports uh, from Montenegro uh, 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 addressing those concerns and also uh, we have uh, seen the failed coup attempt uh, last fall and, uh, and, uh, and the fact that uh, uh, Russian citizens uh, were involved in uh, that attempt. Uh, but for me, this is not an argument against uh, Montenegro joining uh, uh, NATO. For me, this is an argument in favor, an argument in favor because uh, Montenegro has, to, through democratic processes, made a decision they want to join uh, uh, NATO. 28 allies have uh, signed the accession protocol, uh, and almost all of them have also ratified it in the parliament. And it is a sovereign right of every nation to democratic processes to decide which path it wants to uh, choose, including what kind of security arrangements it wants to be part of. So any attempt to intervene or to interfere, so any attempt to interfere in such a uh, process is undermining the sovereign right of a sovereign nation to make its own decisions, and, and of course, Montenegro has that right, and I support it. Lady over there. Thank you. Maria Psara from Ethnos Newspaper Greece. Uh, would you elaborate more about the NATO's mission in GNC, and uh, is Turkey again seeking for an end to these um, operations? Thank you. NATO's presence in the Aegean Sea has been a success and has been uh, important uh, for different reasons. Partly we have been uh, key in helping uh, Frontex, uh, the Greek and the uh, Turkish Coast Guard to address the illegal flow uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the criminal networks uh, 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 facilitating the illegal uh, migration through the, uh, or over the uh, Aegean Sea. Uh, NATO ships have been very often the first spotters of uh, boats and activities. We have shared that information with uh, the local coast guards and they have then taken action. And of course, uh, NATO has also been important because 
uh, it brings together uh, uh, two NATO allies, uh, Turkey and Greece, uh, uh, a non-EU member, Turkey, uh, working with uh, uh, the European Union, Frontex, in the, in the Aegean. Uh, so when I, I visited, for instance, the German flagship uh, Bonn, uh, on that flagship, we had, a, of course, a German admiral, but we also had a, a Turkish liaison officer and a Greek uh, liaison officers. So officer, just underlying that NATO brings together uh, uh, Turkey and Greece, uh, EU and, uh, and NATO in the region. And, and, and also the fact that we have been able to work so closely with the European Union, I think adds to the importance of uh, this uh, uh, mission. Having said all this, of course, th this is not an open, uh, this, this will have an end. Uh, so uh, so uh, uh, we will be there um, as long as there is support for it in, in NATO and as long as we uh, deem it uh, as, as something that adds value. But at some stage, I also expect that our activity in the Aegean will end. Last question, Agence France Presse. Uh, thank you, Secretary General. <clears throat> what, uh, what can we expect for the next meetings? Uh, there, there is the meeting in May. You haven't given a date, so I guess it's not completely clear yet. What about the ministerial meeting of foreign ministers? Uh, is the situation between Turkey and some of the European countries also maybe delaying that meeting that was maybe foreseen somewhere before May? Uh, can you give us some guidance on how what we can expect? Uh, we will have a meeting of heads of states and government uh, in Brussels uh, in the end of May. Uh, uh, the, the meeting will take place in connection with the the G7 meeting uh, which, uh, in Italy. So it will most likely be just before or just after, but we, are, we will soon be able to announce the exact uh, uh, date. Um, uh, the, uh, it will not be a full-fledged summit. The plan is to inaugurate the new building. Uh, so we will have uh, all the heads of state and government, including uh, a new US president and a new French president uh, attending uh, the inauguration. Uh, and we will have a working session where we will uh, discuss how NATO is adapting uh, to uh, new security challenges. And I expect that burden sharing, defense investments, but also how both to spend more, but also how to spend better, uh, will be an important part of uh, the discussion at uh, the meeting in May. Uh, but also uh, what more NATO can do to fight uh, uh, terrorism. Um, uh, then we will also have a foreign ministerial meeting in the beginning of April. Uh, that will be an important uh, building block or part of the uh, preparations for the meetings of heads of state and government uh, in May. And also many NATO uh, allies and I myself will go to Washington uh, next week, uh, no, next week, uh, next week, uh, to participate in the counter ISIL coalition meeting. So that will also provide an informal platform uh, for some of us to discuss the preparations for this meeting in, uh, in May. So we are now preparing uh, for uh, hosting 28 heads of state and government and Montenegro, because uh, Montenegro participates in all our meetings, uh, even though uh, the accession protocol is not ratified in all 28 uh, uh, parliaments. Uh, host them here uh, in, in May and inaugurate the building, address uh, burden sharing, defense spending, and what more NATO can do to fight uh, uh, terrorism. So I'm looking forward to that meeting. Thank you very much. This concludes uh, this press conference. You will have an opportunity to continue uh, talking to the Secretary General off the record uh, at our annual reception, which will be at the end of the corridor. But before you do that, you can take the annual report, which is totally on the record, uh, to your right as you leave this room. Thank you. Thank you.